Ireland has long had a reputation amongst anglers for both the quality and variety of its sea fishing. And even a look at the map of Ireland will show you why. With 3,500 miles of coastline, its variety and quality of fishing is unsurpassed. Whether you want to go fishing from rocks for conger, ling, pollock, wrasse, fishing along shores where bass, ray, even tope are taken, or small inlets and bays where there's plenty of mullet and flatfish to be taken. The, the breadth and variety of the fishing is excellent. For the angler who wants to go after something a little bit better, boats go out every day, charter boats fully equipped, where the angler can tangle anything from big cod to even poor beagle shark. The hospitality and the friendliness of the people is unsurpassed. It attracts every year thousands and thousands of British anglers. Some come to fish the festivals. Top anglers from both the UK and all over the world are attracted over here. Today we're going to meet England captain Alan Yates, a regular visitor to Ireland, as he comes along and fishes off the rocks in County Clare. We're going to take a look at the tackle and methods he uses to catch pollock, wrasse and many other species that are abound in this area. That's what it's all about. Look at that. Superb ballon rest. Makes a break from all them tiddlers from, from Kent shores where I come from. Come over to Clare for a, a week's fishing. Two hours rest bassing restores all the frustrations of, of poor summer. Look at those teeth. Just ideal for crabs, chewing on crabs. Look at them. Fearsome. It's a nice powerful fish. Let's get him back in the water. I've got to take him close to the water down over the back there. And rush him down and put him in the sea. Oh, that was a nice one. Ah. Right, we'll put a fresh bit of bait on. Another go. Rock fishing. Well, it's not everybody's cup of tea. You lose a bit of gear. You've got to fish fairly heavy, and it's pretty rugged terrain, as you can see around us. You've got to watch your footing. There's lots of dangers, and I suppose that's one of the most important aspects to talk about first. Number one, if you're going on the rocks, especially these, beware of wet weather, beware of rain, because it makes the rocks slippery. You want a decent pair of shoes, pumps, trainers. Some anglers wear leather, leather soles, all sorts of things. You can slip on rocks and you're gone. Another important factor is, is the sea. Here, we're at Ballyreen, and it's some 25, 30 foot up off the water. We're fairly safe. It's very rare for a wave to come right over here. Further down, closer to the water, it is dangerous. Big Atlantic swell like this, it can rise and fall 30 foot. And the old saying about every seventh wave being a big one is a good one to remember. Whatever you do, don't go near the water if, if there's any time to swell at all. And if you go down there when it's flat calm, watch, what you, watch your footing and watch the sea all the time. And as I say, we're nice and comfortable up here because we're high and fairly safe, so I haven't got to watch me back too much. Rock fishing, in general, the species that live around rocks, they live from the bottom to the top. There's two or three different species, so it involves several type, different types of fishing. And that's what make, makes it interesting. Another factor that adds to the excitement of rock fishing is the fact that there's plenty of fish. Whereas there's a shortage on some of the sandy beaches, especially in England, in Ireland there's miles and miles of unfished rock ground. And you get a rucksack, a couple of rods, and you can wander for miles. Over here in Clare, it's got a reputation um, for big pollock and wrasse. And this, indeed, ballerine, was seen in, 19, in the 1950s of 
one of the only captures of sharks from the shore in Great Britain and Ireland. A guy called Jack Shine landed several pool beagles off a point down there and uh, with pretty antiquated tackle, cane rods, alvey side cast reels, all a bit of a, well, really antiquated and old stuff that we wouldn't dream of using now, but it was quite a feat because it's not been repeated. And the British record, for instance, all the qualifying weights of 100 pound um, are not going to get bettered. There's just never going to be anybody that's going to catch a shark off the shore. And I'm sure sooner or later, if you sat here long enough through June, July, August and September, you'd catch a shark. Um, Jack Shine's pool beagles mostly came to lures because what happened was anglers were fishing for mackerel with feathers off the rocks and a big porgy had come along and grabbed, well, I say a big porgy, a big porgy for the shore, 50 pound up to about 95, grabbed the, the mackerel off the feathers and of course all that resulted in it, just ripped the feathers up and went away. So Jack Shine rigged up some, some lures, big, big white lures, and that was his favourite method. Um, obviously a balloon or something like that, but it's time. I think if I was to come out here and sit here for four months, I'd expect to see one. I'm not saying you'd catch one, but I'm, I'm definitely positive they still come around here. Anyway, let's get a bit of bait back on and see if we can't catch another S. Right, let's have a look at the tackle. I never use more than one hook for rock fishing, simply because less hooks you've got, the less likely you're of losing a, the losing a gear. Right, right through the trace, got a four ounce lead on the, on the bottom here. A lighter lead is better than a heavy one because a heavy one tends to sink quickly and drops into the rocks and crevices. A light one, you can get it out quickly. I've got just an ordinary straight clip, lead link, then I've got some 20 pound gantel. I just happen to, to like gantel for this bottom length of line. Main line I've got, I've got 45 pound trilene. Um, it's not one of the most popular lines, it, it was popular a few years ago, but it is, it's one of the most strong, tough line. It stands knocks. Some of these cheap pre-stretch lines, uh, expensive pre-stretch lines, won't take the knocks. They are very low diameter and they just won't stand the abrasions of rocks and limpets and all those sort of things. Hook snood, I've got a swivel and the hook snood comes off that and that's 30 pound Maxima. Now, the outfit altogether, this obviously this light line on the bottom is expected if I do get the lead snag to snap first, uh, giving me a stronger link with the fish. But you are going to lose gear because this gets rubbed, this gets rubbed by the rocks and occasionally they'll break off. So just make up a, a, another rig when you want it, that's what I do. I've got all the gear here to make, make one up as I go along. All right, the bait we got on there is a bit of peeler crab and that hook, it's, it's of interest because it is a mustard chemically etched. Um, I've got the box here somewhere. At long last, mustard have brought out a Nordic bend. Um, it's it's modelled on, on the old Viking, which was always popular for wrasse and rock fishing because it's a strong, tough hook. And this one, uh, it's blued, eyed, you can see there. It's a classic Viking shape. And the good thing about it, it's chemically etched. So it's a little bit sharper, or say quite a lot sharper than the ordinary hooks. Right, now crab, as bait for wrasse, um, yeah, it's the favourite bait for the bigger wrasse. Uh, there's no doubt about that. You can catch wrasse on lugworm, you can catch wrasse on ragworm, anything more or less, except fish. They don't really often take fish. But one of the problems is, with, with a crab, often I use just a hard, small hardback crab. I've got peeler crabs here. I like using peelers because I can tie them to the hook so they stay on there. If you use um, an ordinary hardback crab, this is a peeler, but we'll, we'll look at it as a hardback crab. That's about the biggest size you want. The way to fish for ass is just to hook them through the underneath, like that. Now the ras, we're talking big ras here, three, four pounders. The small ones tend to nibble, bite the legs off, bite chunks out, but the big one will take the whole lot. The only thing with it is, once a fish has attacked it, usually if you haven't hooked him on that first couple of bites, he's gone and he's ripped all the bait off. So I tend to fish with a half of a bit bigger crab, peeled. Here's one I've done earlier. Hook it through and a little bit of knitting elastic around it. You don't have to be too fussy, just whip it on there so that the crab stays on. Looks like we're going to have some weather in a minute. Start to spit with rain. 
Just my luck, isn't it? Doesn't very often rain in Ireland, so they tell me. Right, we'll drop it back down now. Rass! Like rocks and weed, and they get right underneath your feet. There's no need to cast. Got a bit of a bit of a tangle there. Throw you back. They get right underneath your feet. So all you've got to do is drop the line straight down in the rocks. Now, when you're out on the rocks, look for a, a hole in the rocks. Um, rats and, love surf, they like a surf, surfy hole. And this one, there's a little bend in the rocks here and a nice little deep hole. And what it is, the bottom's about, oh, I suppose, 20 feet deep. But right down there in the centre of that corner, there's a hole that goes down another 10. And they seem to sit in that. And I've caught brass out of this hole before. So we swing our lid out. Drop it in where we want it. Let it sink. Now the secret of wrasse fishing is that when they bite, they bolt back under underhangs, overhangs, call it what you like. They go straight in crevices, rocks. They go deep in and take your tackle with it. And if you're not paying attention like I'm not now, you're liable to get a bite, they whiz you back in under underhang and you lose your tackle. Now I've got a bite straight away. They're queuing up down there. Oh, he's, he's left it. They tend to pick at the bait. Pick, pick, pick and you've just got to wait. But keep your line tight all the time. I tend to lift mine as soon as I get a bite. Keep the line tight. Yeah, he's having a go. This is where you've got to be careful lifting them. You can soon break your rod tip if you bring them up and put the rod straight up. So you don't want to bring it up any iron about that. Swing it in, grab the line, away. It's only a small fish, a couple of pounds. But we've got to clean out the small ones before we get the big ones. This usual story. A couple of months ago, we had the World Rock Championship on this uh, this patch of rocks and the guy, the best wrasse came out was 5'8". Not a big wrasse by Irish standards, they go up much bigger than that. But it's uh, quite, a, quite a job to get them up on anything but beach casting gear. Right, I'll rush him back pretty quick. It's a lovely fish, lovely bronze colour. You've got to keep hold of them, that's they'll jump and damage themselves. So I've got to keep a good hold of them. Yeah, you can see a lovely colour. Big fins, they're quite powerful. And they do get in them rocks and see that pointed mouth and those teeth they get right in the crevice and grab limpets and crabs so they can get a bait that's anywhere. Right, I'll put him back in the water. Right, he went back okay. Right, let's see if we can bait up and get another one. That bit of crab's a bit dra bedraggled, it's been chewed. Now you see what I mean about line damage, your line gets caught in these crevices and it can be easily nicked. So it's a good idea to check it and even cut a length off and start again with the trace if it does get damaged. Right, we'll put another bit of crab on. You can see the crabs I've got. They're um, all fine Devon peeler crabs. And uh, it doesn't really matter that they're not splitting. Hard crabs are do for wrasse. Right, we've, we've got one already peeled here, so, so I'll put a bit bigger bait on. That's one way we can try to get a bigger fish is put a bigger bait on. Perhaps this time we'll get a big one. A few turns of elastic. There we are. Look at that lovely bit. What self-respecting rascal could turn that down? There's probably a granddaddy down there sitting right under a rock just waiting for the crab to come past him. All these little ones keep rushing in and grabbing it first. Yeah. Right. Matter of getting it in the right spot again. Somewhere about there. Now what I was saying about being in touch with the tackle and not not keep jerking it around until it gets hooked up. It's a matter of feeling where the lead is. A lot of anglers do it instinctively. They know exactly where the lead is. But if you just ignore what the tip's doing and ignore what the weight's doing, then it's in a rock and gone before you know it. 
These fish are on it straight away. I've got another little touch now. Look, there, there he goes. But they're starting to get wary and picking around at the crab. You get a lot of false bites too because the, um, the kelp and the weed is fishing up and down with the swell and it tends to get a dragging effect. So if you get a very slow pull, it's usually a bit of weed. But the rats are really hard rattle. Just let them go, let them go. And when the rod starts going down, up and in. Don't hang around. If you hang around, then he's in the ledge and gone. Yeah, they're picking it around now. Just slightly lift the rod. There's probably three or four rats around the bait arguing about it. And what, it what we need is a big one to come along and swallow it whole. Pays to check the bait quite regularly too, because they soon chew it off. There, he's having a go again. Go on, my beauty. No, we missed that one. Certainly there. I've got a 3-0 on, a 3-0, and it's quite a big hook. And if there's a small rat of pound or so, they're not going to get on it very easily unless they take the point of the hook straight down. That's one way to keep the small ones off, at least you're having trouble catching them, but with a, with a big hook, it keeps the small ones off. Now, if you do get hooked up, now I've got it hooked up there, one of the best ways to get out is to drop the lead and let it take the hook and the tackle back past the ledge and sometimes you'll escape like that. I've dropped it right down. Give it a quick pull now. We're in. I would expect to lose two or three sets of tackle during the day. Now if you've got a resort to pulling it out, remembering your, your tackle is snagged directly below you, you want to keep the rod straight and you don't want to hook the line on the, on the rocks because it'll damage it and break there. So you've got to be very careful, because remember, if you're pulling something at you and the lead comes undone, or the swivel, it could hit you in the face. So it pays to get away at an angle slightly from where you're pulling. Wrap the line around the rod and walk backwards. That's the only way to do it. There's a set of tackle gone, but that's the price you pay for a few rats. Won't take us five minutes to get another rig on. I've changed the, the tackle now since we've lost that set. I've put a, a breakaway on. Now breakaways are not really compatible with rocks a lot of the time, but they sometimes stop the lead rolling around, so we'll try that. But more importantly, I've got a snood trapped with a swivel and beads with power gum stop knots. This, this is power gum. What it in fact does, it's, it's trapped the snood in position, but it will slip. And if you fish in the rocks with this, this type of tackle, what happens, the hook gets hooked up and the snood slips. Now that has the effect of Releasing the hook quite often is quite a good, good way of getting free. Well worth trying. Anyway, we'll drop this in and see if we can't get that granddaddy wrasse. I've got a nice, uh, this abu, it's an 8000. It's just the right reel for rock fishing for wrasse. Not going to fast retrieve, but it's a strong, solid reel. And that's just what you want for this lark. Right, on the bottom. Engage the reel, and we're ready for a bite. I can just imagine that big rass down there waiting to chew that bait up. Yep, they're there. it's there straight away. It's those small ones picking it about. He's on the ledge. Oh, he's a nice one, nice bright one. A bit bigger this one, so I'll watch the tip of the rod now and line him up. Oh, he's not a monster. He's a nice fish. Again, that two and a half pound, they're solid, solid fish and they weigh heavy. 
Oh, and he bit me then. Got to be careful of those teeth. They've got quite a, quite a grip. All right, let's take the hook out and we'll catch another one. We'll put him back in the pool. I think what I'll do, I've had enough rest now. We'll try for a pollock in a minute. So I'll let him go and we'll try for a pollock. Right, it's another rash successfully back in the sea alive. Right, I think we've had enough rash now. We've had a little squall. I'm getting a bit weary. I think I'll put my coat on in a minute. That's Ireland for you. You get a shower every five minutes. The other side of the mountain is probably bright sunshine. It's gone quite, quite nasty now. There's a, overhead the clouds, it's bright behind the clouds. Anyway, we'll put this one away. We'll try for a pollock. Now, there's two or three ways of catching pollock off the rocks, but one of the favourite, got to be the favourite, is to catch him with a red gill. Pollock are suckers for red gill, or so they tell me. I've had some of my biggest ones in Clare, up to about eight pound on red gills. The red gill was invented a few years ago, all it is is a rubber imitation sand eel. Now they come in various colours. But because the original one was, was called a red gill, that's the name we call them. So we, we're using a blue gill in, in fact this time. But off the rocks in Clare, green and blue are favourite. The natural one sometimes works, but, and a bright orange one. So there are a few day glow colours around, but I prefer the blue or the green, especially for the big pollock. Now, the rig, I've got a, a Paul Kerry high performance match rod which is soft enough to give you a bit of fun with a couple of pound pollock. A Daiwa HT, 7HT, and it's got 15 pound line straight through. I've got a two and a half ounce bomb, and here we've got a straight lead link with a short trace off to the, off to the red gill. I suppose what that, six foot. Now, Sometimes when the pollock are timid, you might want a longer one. Other times I've seen anglers be successful with a three foot, with a three foot trace. Pollock are just not put off by the lead going through the water in front of the red gill. Now bass would be, and quite a lot of other fish do, but the pollock don't seem to mind. So you can get away with about a six foot trace. Now obviously, casting the trace off of the rocks with a long trace, you've got to be careful you don't hook it up in the rocks behind you. I saw a chap do that a few years ago, and. Uh, the gill hooked up, the line broke, and the lead come back and hit him in the head. So what I do, there's two or three ways of doing it, but some, some anglers put a panel pin in the, in the lead and just hang the gill on the panel pin. All I do is I just nip the point of the hook in the lead so that it hangs. That way, it'll come off when it hits the water or after you've cast. Right, now the pollock, swim fairly close to the to the edge of the kelp you can get them right in but usually it's underneath the rocks or just 30 foot out at most not right out so what i'll do i'll move out onto this rocky promontory here so i can cast along the rocks obviously with this kind of fishing mind where you go alan with this kind of fishing you couldn't do it if you had someone upstream or similarly downstream there's anglers down there so i would cast up here now it's simply a matter you don't have to cast a long way, just a lob. Let it sink. Say it's about 30 foot. Now the bottom is kelpy, so you've got to be careful. And there is, as I said before in the rass fishing, a certain feel that you get. Now while I'm talking to you, I'm going to get hooked up. But anyway, I've got to concentrate on reeling in. You don't have to jerk or lift the rod up and down, sink and draw like you do with mackerel. You just continually reel at a set speed. If you don't get any results with so that speed, slow it down. I find that's about right. Now the pollock will follow it, nibble it, and if they are hungry they just snap it. And the initial dive they give you, they go straight to the bottom. I don't, I don't really believe there's another fish that is so powerful, apart from the coal fish, as the pollock on its initial dive. 
Now you can spin with a bit lighter gear, fixed ball reels, spinning rod. But over here in Clare, you're likely to get a, a five or six pound pollock and that's going to test five pound line. Right, we've, we've come right into the edge. So I prefer to stick to, to 15, at least 12. Right, there we are, it came off all right, you see. What we do, hook the gill again. After a while, you get a little hole there, and that it really starts to work well then. Now this time, I'll let it get to the bottom and come back a little bit slower. It goes down. As I said, a bluegill is one of my favourites. But if you don't get a response out of a bluegill, try a red one, try a pink one, try any colour. Black currant's quite, quite a favourite. And the boat anglers seem to prefer black. Black never works on the shore, only for bass. But orange, green, blue. Slowly. Now you've got to be careful. The gill hooks up. I've put a, an Aberdeen, mustard Aberdeen blue 2 0 on there. Now that's quite a soft hook, and 15 pound line will just bend it out enough to get it away from most snags. So be warned, don't use a very strong hook because if you use a hook that won't bend, every time you do get hooked up, you'll never get it back. And, I mean, I've seen guys lose 10 or 15 red gills in a day. Well, that's all right if you're catching fish, but it can be a bit expensive. Is there a pollock at home? No, you, you get, as it touches the bottom, the, the trick is to strike every time. Yes. Yes! Whoa, let the clutch off a bit. Right, now I've got to lift this one. I've only got a 2-0 on there, and it's an Aberdeen Blue, so you've got to be very careful. Here we come. Careful. Oh yeah, cracking pollock, that one. Not a monster. A couple of pound, two and a half pound. They like those blue red gills. Look at that, right in the front of the mouth. He's obviously chasing that wiggly tail. Let's get the hook out. As you can see, they've got a great big mouth. They chase white bait all the time, that's what they feed on. They also scavenge on lumps of mackerel and crab and anything that's lying around. But they're primarily a midwater fish, midwater and bottom fish, and they charge around chasing the shoals of white bait. The trouble with them is when you catch them on a high rock point like this, if you drop them, they damage. So you've got to be very careful. Get a good grip with him. You can see the big eyes. Sight's their main. They target in with the sight. They've also got the lateral line. They can obviously feel the vibrations, but they see what they're going to eat first. That's why they're so fussy about the colours. Right, I'll get him in before he does any damage. Right, that's him back. Just wipe my hands. Yeah. Right, I think I'll try another another colour red gill because they're probably wise to blue now. I've got some green ones in here and some black ones. You can also use spinners as well, if you like. I mean, that's a pike spinner that's ideal for... And the old Toby, they're popular. I think I've got one or two others in here. There's a black red gill. Now, as I said before, they seem favourite in the boat, but they're worth a try if the fish dry up. Try another colour. Ah, oh, there's a green one. What else we got in here? Oh, various and sundry tobies. These are nice if you want to use a light spinning rod. There's just enough weight to cast there without having to have a lead on there as well. Anyway, we'll put them back in there and we'll try this, this green one. Pays to have a couple of traces made up ready. As I said earlier, they get damaged. So we'll just clip that off put another colour on. Away we go with the blood knot. I'll try the, um, the float rod in a minute. Catch a, another one. And we'll try the float rod. I'm just repairing 
this nut because it was a bit damaged on the actual main line. Put your glasses on, Alan, you'll be able to see better. Right, there we are. Now, the, the green red gill, they, with a the pollock with the big eyes, I'm sure that they can see the green from a long way away. They really are fr a fluorescent green. That fish took me just under that reef. There's some white water down there and it obviously marks where the reef is. And he took me just behind the reef. And they tried to get back in the kelp. Quite a powerful surge, that first bite. Right, we're ready. There we go. Right, this trace is just, it's not as long as the, the, the blue one we had on. It's long enough to cast. So we cast along the rock face, 70 yards. That's plenty. Let it sink to the bottom. And we try and fool them with a green one. I'll stand up this time. It's handy when you are spinning for pollock if you can get low to the water. Obviously, you can keep the, the gill trundling along the top of the rocks or the kelp. Unfortunately, we can't here because we're high up. So, what I'm doing, I'm slowed down the retrieve and try to get it to trickle as close to the bottom as I can. But the pollock will follow it once one sees it. He'll follow it right up to the surface sometimes and take it a matter of feet under. Now, do they like the blue one, the green one? Now, there's a deadly spot just coming past it now. This is a bit like trout fishing. You've got to keep the, keep the speed of the lure constant. If you jerk it about, they don't seem to want to know. Yeah. Oh yes, yes, we're in. Yes. Not a very big one, this one, but ah, oh, it's a little baby one. Look at that. Ah, oh, a little tiny one. Lovely little pollock. Look at him. Right, we let him go. We'll throw him off the top here. He'll be okay because he's he's not too heavy. And you can come back when you're a nine-pound clear specimen. See, he's got not got that bronze colour. That deep bronze, there's still big eyes though. Right, we can drop him straight in. Cheerio fella. Yeah, he's gone. If you try to do that with a big one, it hit, hit the, the water and he'll just flatten out and die. But a small one, no weight to him, straight in. Right, we'll have another cast. There must be a bigger one out there. That was exactly that same spot again, right by the edge of that reef. They must be shoaling up behind there. This style of reeling in, I copied this off of Mick Toomer, he's a boat angler. I criticised him because I thought it looked cack handed but for this kind of fishing, it's just ideal. You've got the reel right in front of you. This way, when I'm under pressure and got fish to pull in, when I want to put some pressure on the fish, but this way, you can really feel, feel the lure working and you're in complete control because you can give it a quick strike. Getting near to the hot spot again. I'll tell you what, I reckon I could get a float down there. We'll try in a minute, we'll try a float right behind the back of that, behind the back of that ridge. There it, there it is, right there. No takers? Not this time. No, I think I'll give a Give the float rod a go. We can float fish both the pollock and wrasse. Now for this float rig, I've got a much lighter outfit. Got a fixed ball reel, got a Mitchell match, freshwater reel, but it's just right. 12 pound line. I wouldn't fish with much lighter on the rocks because the damage of the line, you can get away with six pound, but the line get damaged quickly. The rod, this one's a, a Daiwa sea bass. Not, not an ultra light rod, but it's, it's just ideal. It's strong enough to be able to pull a fish up the rocks. Because if you use a very light spinning rod, 
you've got it doubled over. Okay, you're going to get a net, but the swell's so bad that it's job to get a fish in the net off, off rocks like this. Right, the actual outfit we've got, we've got a, a sliding float. All I've got is a short trace I've got on the hook. That's a one size one camera sand now. I've got that on there because I've got some small sandals I want to try, but I'd possibly go up to a 2 or 3 0 for a crab bait or for a big fish bait. Trace, we've got a swivel, a little bomb just to give it enough weight to go down. You can use a barrel lead or a coffin lead. Uh, I've got no preference, but that bomb does the job. The, the float, you want a, quite a substantial float, it's no use using anything too small because the pollock could take it under and it's gone and it'll go straight down and bury into the kelp before you know it. So, on occasion we re use really big floats in Clare when we're match fishing, a bull cock. You might laugh, but they really work. And uh, Timmy Fagg from Kent won the World Rock Championship last year using a bull cock. And uh, it really works. What we do, this one is sliding. We've got the lead fixed there so it doesn't slide up. Makes it easier for casting. And then on the line, We've got a power gum stop knot. Can you see that? I've got two stop knots there. One locked against the other, just for a bit of extra security. Now, the power gum, I mentioned it earlier, it's got lots of uses, and this is one of them. It's soft, it'll go through the rings, but it will stop when it comes to the float. If you use monofilament, that can sometimes jam in the ring, and I've actually seen people jam it in the ring and break the line. But the old power gum, multi-uses, that'll go through the ring easy. This way you can fish any depth you like and all you need to do to, to reduce your depth is just move your stop knot up the line. Now the other advantage of using power gum is that it doesn't damage monofilament. If you use monofilament and tie it tightly it will damage the line. So we're fishing at about, let's see, I would say 12 foot there. That, that should be okay. Right, for a pollock, let's try for a pollock first. I've got some sandals, keep well in a, in a food flask, they've got all sorts of uses, we can use them for dogfish on the bottom, but Pollock love them as well, got various sizes, see they're still frozen, they've been there like that for quite a time now, pick one out, these are ammo ones, and uh, frozen ammo, stung them, as most of them are pretty good, as long as you keep them from thawing out, if you can keep them frozen, when you take them home from the shop, go to the shop with a, with a, um, a thermos flask or, or a, a, a cool box or something like that and take them home, put them in the fridge so you keep them frozen because once they thaw out they get soft and red heads and they just burst when you put them on the hook. Now when you take them out of the thermos flask, timing is crucial because they thaw pretty quick. The trick is to get them on the, on the hook without damaging them too much. So we just thread this one on. There's various ways of putting them on. You can put the hook right through the eel so that the point comes out the tail, or I prefer just to nick it in the head like that. It hangs like that with the hook coming out just behind the gill. Right. We'll go out on the on the edge again because the wind's blowing us back, it's blowing our line back, and I shall get caught up on the on the corner there. So I want to get out as far as I can. Now the wind's quite strong, so I want to cast up the wind a bit and let the float hit the water and sink to the depth. It hits the stop knot, the float a cock. Now with these pollock using a red gill, they won't always take a static bait like that, although it's moving around in the waves. Sometimes you can help it along by just spinning it back and they'll follow it and take it. Stop occasionally, let it sink back and reel in again. Those big eyes, it's the movement that's the key. But of course the advantage of sand eel is it's got a bit of scent as well. So if they're a bit fussy, sometimes they'll prefer a, a, a good sand eel to a rubber eel. Keep it moving, keep it moving, drop it down. Now usually if you get a bite, 
you'll see it on the rod tip, not the float so much. The float is more or less to keep it away from the edge, to keep it out and keep the depth you're fishing at. If you've just had a lead, it, it's obviously sink to the bottom. So you're not really watching the float, although you will see if you get a bite, the tip will go down and the float will go down as well. Now we're right on the edge now where we caught those two with the red gill. We'll let it right down to the bottom and see if we get a pull. No, I don't think that was a, I think that was a bottom. That's on a bit too, a bit too deep. What you've got to do is mess around until you get the right dip. What you want it is just trickling on the bottom. If the float get, keeps getting caught up, obviously you're fishing too deep. I had something touch it then, I thought it was the bottom. Better check the bait. They soon chew the tails off these sand hills. No, it looks okay. Yeah, it's a, bit, it's a bit damaged. We'll put another one on there and try again. Bit of ground bait. Now, failing that, what we'll do, we'll see if the wrasse is still in resident. residence. We'll put a bit of crab on. Nice juicy bit of crab. As I say, you don't need to be. It's quite fun watching the float go under when you've got a rat on it. Not too fussy about moving the shell. We've left the rat alone for a bit, so perhaps we'll catch another one of those. One of the advantages of fishing for rats with a float is that you don't get uh, hooked in the bottom quite so much because you see the bite very quick and you can keep the bait just up off the bottom. Right, let's see if we can get it back in that, that little hole down the bottom there. A lot, a lot of sea anglers do do much folk fishing but the rocks, it's an ideal place if you want a nice relaxing day to go and sit and watch a float. And there's something about float fishing, seeing that float go under. Right, now let it sink down. It's got a nice, it's a Drennan Piker that one, so it's got a nice bright red tip. And that should go really straight down if we get a wrasse on the end of that. Of course we might get a pollock. Yeah. Would you believe it's a pollock? I go after a rat and get a pollock. That's pretty typical of rock fishing. Oh, it's not a bad one. I'm gonna have to be careful getting him up, I think. I've only got a uh, light line on this float. I'll do the clutch right up and lift him carefully. You're right. That's one of the troubles with a fixed ball reel. You can't wind them when you've got a heavy weight on. Especially a small one like that. I'll have to pull it up, hand line it up. This is where it's handy, if there is a couple of you, because I wouldn't recommend you go rock fishing on your own like I am. Well, I'm not really on my own, you're here, but it's a good idea to go rock fishing in pairs. And never go without telling someone where you're going and when you're going and when you're expected back. There we are. Fish for a wrasse with a float and you get a pollock. Get a good grip of him. Well, I think I'll have another one of them. They go even better on that lighter rod. Right, we'll just put him back. Right, let's have a look at that bait. I think it's a bit chewed up. We want to noob it on there. Right, I think the tide's making now. We've got a couple of lobster pots out here. That's something you've got, you've got to watch when you're rock fishing in Ireland. The Irish fishermen tend to put them close to the rocks because that's the best place to catch lobsters. If you're, if you're not careful, you'll one up if you're casting out. Well, those have drifted out a bit now. The tide's coming up quite fast. Tide 
it's something that you haven't got to worry about too much in Ireland. There's, there's a few more fish in it than England, well, just a few more. And whereas at home, I would have to really fish at the peak time of tide and be particularly fussy when I fished in Ireland, on the rocks, you can virtually fish any time, high water, low water. Obviously, there are, are venues where high water's best, venues where low water's best, but usually, I mean, we fished quite a, quite a length of low water down and then back in again now. It's starting to make, and we've caught fish all the time. Right, we'll have another bit of crab. Let's be fussy with a nice rassy bit and perhaps we'll get a rass this time. I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll leave most of the shell on. Of course I could always put a sandy on and bound to get a rass then, but that's fishing. It's part of the fun, you never know what you're going to get. Even in situations like this when you can more or less predict 90% of what you're going to catch. Right, right that goes on there. Obviously I was a bit higher up in the water that time, I think, to get the pollock, so I'll put the, the tides coming up, so I've got to adjust the, f the slider, the sliding float, all the time while I'm fishing. It's no good just putting, setting it at one depth and expecting the fish to follow it. Obviously as the tide comes up, if, if the tide's going to come up 10 foot, then your, your bait's going to be 10 foot higher in the water. So what we do, we'll go drop that stop knot back a bit further. Where are we? Yep, there. Couple of foot deeper. See what that does. Right, let's have another go. Oh, I've got a bigger now. Right, not tangled up. I fished. Uh, Along this stretch of rocks, two years running in the World Rock Championship, I've never got drawn on this peg. Always out the front there, it doesn't fish very well out there for some reason. And whoever draws these pegs up here, they're fairly close together, they, though they tend to peg every other one, usually catches all the fish, especially the pollock. Right. Let it sink. Let's see if we can't get a rest this time. You can see the bait going down for quite a way, that water's clear, even though it's rough. I was talking about tides earlier on. Now, although fishing in Ireland you don't really need to know what time high water and low water it is, it pays to learn about the tides. Um, two high tides every, every 24 hours is the basic rule. And the tide is caused by the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon. You get the big tides when the tide comes up a long way, they're calling the spring. That's when the sun and moons together create the biggest amount of gravitational pull. When the sun and moon are not aligned, um, there's less gravitational pull. We get the neap tides. Now, in a lot of areas of the coast, the spring tides are the best time to fish. It's quite understandable that because the tide's coming up, it's the strongest, it's moving the most, and generally fish tend to tend to rush around and feed when the, when the tide's moving. Neap tides usually especially in England, don't produce the best fishing. Right, we're in about the right place now for a pollock, right on that reef. And watch that float. Let's give it a little twitch, see if he'll follow a bit of crab. Yeah. They really dive away bites when they go, pollock, because they grab it and go straight to the bottom. We could, if we wanted to, trot right along here. That's the beauty of the float fishing. You're covering a lot of ground. Same as the red gilling. You can cover lots of ground. And of course, being mobile helps. Don't always tie yourself down to, to having a base camp like I am here. You can rove around the rocks. There's miles in, in Clare, particularly. Choose your weapon and go for a wander. That's what I, I would recommend. Right, gone a bit too far out now. I want to get closer to the face of the rock. No, they don't like the crab now. Put it right back in under that ridge. Drop it down.
Right. I may try fishing on the bottom in a minute. I've got a, a rod rigged up over there ready for bottom fishing. The only problem, a lot of Ireland, you get a lot of dogfish. It can be a, be a pain sometimes. And uh, catching ras pollock is a lot more fun, a lot more action than waiting for a dull old dogfish to come along. Mind you, this, this mark here, you do catch some unusual fish. In early June, July, they get a lot of thornback ray off here. And um, there's also every chance of coddling, would you believe? I've even seen a pouting off here. Good old pouting. They have a dab's place. And there's one or two big congas under the, under the bottom here if you sit and wait for them. We'll try, we'll try uh, with a bit of fish bait in a minute, but we can't seem to get any response from this bit of crab now. Let's put it right under the face there. Right, we're right alongside the rocks now. We're right on the edge. Yeah, something a go at that float. It's away. I've got this clutch set very light because they don't half go. Cool. It's another pollock, I reckon. Well, would you believe it's a rass this time? Oh, it's a that's not a bad one either. Might have a job to get it up on this line. Definitely have to hand line it. Easy does it. Careful. This is where you fall in and get overexcited. I get excited about any fish. Don't matter how big it is. I like tiddlers as well. Look at that. Yeah, it's a lovely wrasse. Yes. Ooh. Not a monster, but on 12 pound line and a bass rod, quite capable of giving you a bit of, bit of sport. Right, we'll take that, that hook out and get him back. Right. Right, he's gone back okay. Well, we've had a nice day, caught a lot of, a lot of rats and pollock. Not monsters. There are some monsters in Ireland to catch. We've had average sized fish, I suppose. But that's what sea fishing's about most of the time. It's not always about record breakers. There's plenty of small fish, to, and you can have some good fun with them. Well, while I'm packing up, I'll just square this gear, gear away. We'll go through a few points of the day. Right, first of all, I can't overemphasize the safety aspect of fishing off rocks. It's advisable always to fish in pairs or an, and let everybody know where you are. Good footwear, pumps as I said are all right, they give you a firm, good firm grip and you're not really going to slip over. You've got to have awareness of the sea, the sea is very dangerous, these big waves can knock you flat and the best swimmer in the world is not going to get out in that kind of swell he's going to be battered up against the rocks and, and drown. So always be aware of the safety aspect. Right, the tackle, as I said, roving is the best way to fish the rocks. A rucksack like this one, it's a Titan one, they make some good gear for, for rovers. Nice and stout, you can get plenty of gear in it. Matter of fact, what I do, just a little tip there is, I put a Tupperware box in the bottom. It stops, stops the bottom of the rucksack wearing. Anyway, so you've got a rucksack, a rod. I mean, you can get away with one rod, but of course one rod won't do all the jobs. You want a couple of three. So I've given you a good idea today of, of what to carry. You can either carry a light spinning rod like this one, this bass rod, even lighter if you want to go light, or a middle of the range beach caster, like this uh, Paul Carey match one with a, with a red gill on, or a pretty stout, stout rod like this Abu. 
and the 45 pound line for the for the wrasse and the congas of course you could fish for congas and last of all we've got this outfit here we haven't managed to fish with this today this is just for casting off the rocks we've had so much fun catching wrasse and pollock that i never did get to go and catch a silly dogfish but anyway that's just basic beach gear with slightly heavier line and a fast retriever. Well, we thank the Irish Tourist Board for, for uh, allowing us to come over and enjoy a day's fishing in Clare. Uh, we're going to head back to the hotel now. The, if I can say the name, it's uh, up in Galway. It's about 40 miles away. Uh, we've come a long way for our fishing because simply this is one of the best spots. We didn't mind the weather being in our face. Um, usually you find if you, if you fish into the weather, that's where you're going to get the fish. Uh, you can, if you've got any queries on any part of this film or any questions for me, I can always be reached through Sea Angler, Ask Alan, Sea Angler, Breton Court, Breton Peterborough. Write me a letter any time. I'm not guaranteed you'll get an answer in the, in the magazine, but I certainly do my best. You send a stamp to just envelope, I can assure you'll get an answer. Any aspect of this film or any, any fishing problem you've got at all. As I said, I've not done everything in this film. We haven't bottom fished, perhaps another day. We can try off the rocks or off a strand somewhere and catch some fish with the bottom gear. But light tackle, good fun, rass and pollock, don't underestimate them. You can really have some enjoyable fishing by chasing after the shoals. See you again sometime. Bye.